I popped my cherry on the fake horse today. Having Evie on the back. <laughs> and then the first time they had this set up. So she's behind me. As nerds have consolidated more and more power, we have demanded more from our very serious productions about laser dragons and laser dragons. It turns my stomach. That's why so many nerd properties now feature their own constructed languages like Dothraki from Game of Thrones, Na'vi from Avatar, or Klingon from Star Trek. Some actors and actresses, like Amelia Clark, can speak these nonsense languages incredibly well. Whenever Clark speaks High Valyrian or Dothraki, you can feel the emotion and nuance and how she wants to cut everybody in half and or set them on fire even without reading the subtitles. But that's not always the case. For example, in Star Trek 3, The Search for Spurk, Christopher Lloyd's Klingon delivery is so wooden and features so many unnecessary pauses. Dosh! Chonta! Yeah. It's clear what he's trying to say is, how did I get roped into this stupid nerd shit? Kach. He seems to have a little trouble putting his heart into made-up lines that must sound to him like a jammed printer. You see the same problem with Natiri's parents in Avatar or pretty much every Martian in John Carter. Tarkus. All of them needlessly accentuate every word in their lines because to them it's just random noise they had to memorize by ear. And speaking of Martians, Matt Damon didn't even attempt an authentic Martian accent. Because I'm stupid. But check out Alicia Debnam Carey speaking Trigodus Lang, the fictional language from the 100. I don't sin in, she be like I gaff sin in. She sounds pretty good, right? Maybe that's the difference. Actresses like Debnam Carey and Clark are pretty young and therefore grew up in geekier times, so maybe their brain doesn't subconsciously want to give itself a wedgie for trying to master a skill about as useful in the real world as authentically being able to mimic TIE fighter sounds with your mouth. This could also explain Zoe Zaldana's believable Na'vi in Avatar, despite presumably her just sitting in some blue room somewhere pretending she gave a shit about a huge magic tree. And speaking of actors acting with basically nothing around them, that's another weirdly specific skill. For example, while filming The Hobbit, Peter Jackson used extensive green screen to make all the dwarf and hobbit actors look fun-sized because all that forced perspective camera trickery from the Ridge Tridge is a young man's game, or at least the game of a man who gives even half a shit about the movie he's making. There is no point in arguing. I didn't know what they I was doing. During one such shoot, Ian Gandalf McCallan sat alone at a table surrounded by lamps with picture cutouts of his co-stars glued to them that'd be replaced by the scaled down actors in post. And he just broke down crying and said, it's not what I do for a living. I act with other people. I don't act on my own. Similarly, when Ewan McGregor recalled what he didn't like about playing Obi-Wan Kenobi in the Star Wars prequels, he said it was having to deliver already awkward lines and even more awkward tennis balls on sticks. Also, probably everything else. Mother. More did you speak? The reason McKellen and McGregor felt the way they did was because acting is just like slowly, sensuously slurping a super long spaghetti noodle. Unless you have someone to do it with, it just looks kind of sad and weird. <laughs> This brings us to Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow. In it, Gwyneth Paltrow supposedly investigates giant, maybe Nazi robots, but instead appears to be bored and wondering what part of her body she should make into a candle scent. And I was like, this smells like my vagina. <laughs> right. You just never buy that she's supposedly witnessing walking buildings showcasing the awe-inspiring and terrible power of technology. She's just wondering what her bits would smell like when set on fire. <laughs> but now let's look at Naomi Watts' brilliant performance in King Kong. For every scene where Kong holds Watts in his giant hand, Watts had to get into this ridiculous contraption and cry and scream out of pants sweating fear, all to make us believe that she really was in the grips of a giant ape, when in fact, she was wearing a couple of moldy sausages and an oversized belt. And the fact that she made it work speaks volumes to her talents at this very specific kind of acting. But let's not forget actors who are there physically, except for their face. As in, they wear a mask. With these powers, I could be a superhero! For example, look at Julian McMahon's performance as Doctor Doom in 2005's Fantastic Four. McMahon's not a bad actor, he just projects very little confidence, which makes all his movements look exaggerated, stiff, and unnatural, as if he was starring in a community college play about his own sex life. It's gonna be fun! <laughs> The problem is most actors learn to act primarily with their face and ignore the body. Sometimes when you put a mask on an actor, it's as if they're learning to walk for the first time. It accidentally works with, say, Jason from all the Friday the 13th movies because his awkward body language emphasizes his lack of humanity. Son of a bitch. <laughs> But with, say, like General Clytus from Flash Gordon or the Humongous in Mad Max 2, their awkward body language is just awkward. Like, Clytus can't even die convincingly. Clytus. Mm -hmm. 
On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool. Sure, the mask CGI might have had a tiny baby hand in it, but it never feels like you're looking at a faceless character. Probably because the unmasked and masked versions are so in sync. I know, right? They move exactly the same way, they sound the same way, and so whenever you see Deadpool, you automatically see Ryan Reynolds under the mask. Maximum effort. Then you have Star Wars and Adam Driver's masked and unmasked Kylo Ren, which are essentially two completely different characters. One is a lost child, and the other is basically a young Darth Vader, and despite what Lucas tried to do with the prequels, the two should not be one and the same. I'm a person, and my name is John Cena! <laughs> While wearing the mask, Kylo Ren is swift and intimidating, but also unpredictable and sort of unbalanced, while without the helmet, he transforms into a reserved, timid kid who always seems like he's playing that badass Sith Lord dress up, while the masked Ren is a badass Sith Lord. Each performance tells a different story, and together they make up the complex whole of the character. And that's not even including shirtless Ren, which adds a whole other sweaty side to the character, and also my daydreams. It's your greatest weakness. Still though, the award for best masked performance can only go to Hugo Weaving as V and V for Vendetta, because with him, you can always feel every emotion that he's going through underneath the totally static mask, thanks to his body language and his tone of voice and the way that he knifes people in their vital organs. It's subtle, but I think that last one means that he's hungry for murder. <laughs> Verily, this vicious swears of verbiage veers most verbose 